and self-determination was not and is not yet another organization. It's a way for brothers and sisters to communicate and participate in forums and discussions and support the various things that we, we do in community. We, we often say that everything that you can think of that needs to be done in our community, usually somebody's trying to do it. They just need recognition and support to get it done. Brother, and he can of, yes. at eight minutes. You got two minutes left. All right, that's great uh, that you uh, prompted me because I'll have everybody here all week. Um, but uh, so out of that group, the current uh, uh, formation that I'm associated with is Us Lifting Us Economic Development Cooperative. It speaks specifically to the economic imperatives. Of course, we know that when we talk about community, we're talking about economics, politics, and culture that make up the, the social fabric. And so uh, Us Lifting Us speaks to that foundation. Uh, in closing, I'd like to encourage everyone on the, the, the platform and everyone listening to read a, a small book. It's called The Sovereign Psyche. And uh, the ebook is only $4 and some change. The author is Ezra Aharon, who's a professor at Delaware State University. What he tries to get us to consider <clears throat> are three kinds of principles or mindsets. The first one is chattel slavery. And I think we kind of understand what that's about. The second one is chattel freedom. And he suggests that as an evolutionary process, that's kind of where we are at the chattel freedom uh, position. You know, even though we may be free, we're still, still hanging on to many aspects of, of the plantation. And the third aspect uh, that he explains is self-authentic freedom. And he says that that's where we're moving. That's when we are no longer shackled mentally, spiritually to the plantation. And in that space, there are only two things that we focus on, is building systems and institutions that promote our group self-interest. And so functional unity comes out of that spirit where we have gotten to a point where we know that the onus is on us and that we simply must build the systems and the institutions that support them and sustain them uh, so that they're around to serve the needs of brothers and sisters who come after us. Thank you, family, for the opportunity to share. Brother Hakima, please say the name of that book again so I can type it in the chat. The Sovereign Psyche. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's, I think that was my 10 minutes, correct? Yes, that's right. Now we have 10 <laughs> minutes. We have right. 10 minutes from Pam Africa now. Okay, on the move, and uh, really thanks, you know, for um, having me as a part of this program, and I just want to say, um, you know, I really appreciate the history that Brother just gave, um, and Brother Bilal, and uh, I look to him the same way, you know, with much respect, and all, uh, you know, when things is wrong in our community, I call him, I call him. And, you know, he's always been fair. He let me know when I'm wrong. <laughs> and, mm. um, you know, um, dealing with, I think we need to deal with something else here too. And uh, because I've been a victim of it and might be still be just the functional depression that we're going through. And, you know, in order to build unity and stuff, we got to recognize the problems that's in this time that we're, you know, that we're all going through. Um, 
you know, with people dying all around us, close to us, and, you know, you can't process one, and then here's another, and then with all the other things that's happening, we got to look closely at our comrades who appear to be functioning good, and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, because I was a little off a couple weeks ago, I mean, really off, and um, talking with Brother Balau, and, uh, you know, he helped me through it, and Sister Filet helped me through it, and uh, um, so I'm just saying that to say, you know, we need to really, you know, um, check on our people, you know, much closer than we have, and uh, because we are in, you know, all suffering from depression, you know, we can't help but being depressed with what's going on right here. And we do need each other, truly need each other to care for, you know, each one of us. Um, you know, with that being said, my name is Pam Africa, I'm Minister of Confrontation for the MOVE organization, one of, and um, Chairwoman of the Uncompromising International Concerned Family and Friends of Mumia Abu-Jamal. When I first came on the scene, I knew nothing about revolution. I knew nothing about political prisoners. And, you know, I was helped through the teachings of John Africa and I was given the gift and the understanding of what love is and, uh, you know, um, and still learning and still learning. And uh, because in order to be able to deal in this revolution, you got to have true love for life. And um, our fight is, you know, for all life without exception. And when you um, care for all life, you know, because, you know, John Africa taught us, you know, about the principle of freedom and, you know, the fight for freedom and made us understand that, you know, until all life is free, no life will be free. And in doing that, um, we were able to raise an army of people to not only fight for Mumia's life, not only to fight for, you know, Mu's life, and all, but to fight for, you know, all political prisoners. Um, you know, and, and the thing is, you know, not being afraid to step to whatever so-called powers there is. And, uh, and you know, like when, when people are involved in this movement, and all, you know, when they step off for whatever reason, and all, you know, you got to keep going so that when the person come back, I'm not questioning about where you've been, what you've been doing. You had that desire to come back into this fold. You're not coming to coming back where you were at five years ago, two years ago, a month ago, because this movement has got to continue to move. It has to continue to grow and it got to continue to bring more people in when uh, John Africa taught us that when we go into meetings or go into places that we've never been before, go in as move and come out as move. Come in and uh, not thinking that you know it all, that you got it, and uh, but sharing what it is that you have learned with other people and being interested in what it is that they, the values of what it is that they have and are uh, and you know, move, you know, that particular way. A, a good example is like when Mumia had hepatitis C and, you know, we needed to build a movement. You mm -hmm. know, we're not the first ones to start dealing with hepatitis C at all. And, uh, but we dealing with Mumia, um, I got more into it and, uh, you know, and had to go to places we had went to Harrisburg and protested there, went to the governor's house and protested there. And, uh, but then we had to do something that, you know, most people thought, well, you know, the governor have an office in Center City. He's never there. So people position was, you know, well, what is the purpose in going there? He's not there. Our purpose isn't him because this man will hear what it is that we have to say from other people. This was smack dab in Center City, the upcoming avenue of the arts, all the fancy hotels there, and we would go there and uh, with our bullhorns and things and, you know, put out information, what would happen, they would close it down. 
the people couldn't get on the end um people the um guests who had a lot of money and stuff couldn't get in but they because what they would do was close the front off and take everybody around the back and um you know but we're still there and we're putting out information some people you know everybody had their own style and i have my style you know of putting out information and gathering people and what happened the people who were shifted to go around the back who spent all that money to come in there they were like you know well what's going on here that's how educational piece hepatitis c don't just affect people inside the prison it affects all of us and that's what we had to do we had to reach and get people to understand i wound up going to um the um board of health and um finding out that they had you know um information on hepatitis c they had a very descriptive um presentation that they had to show the vastness of hepatitis C, and they also called it an epidemic. I didn't have that word in my in, in my vocabulary for that. It's an epidemic, and then I wound up going to the John Jay. It's um, a place for gay men because I found out that they had you know information that was happening that was there that we needed so i sat down i had meetings with them and they had stacks of information on what you know how to help people that were in the prison and that was coming out out of the prison they had handbooks that had all kinds of information that we needed that wasn't in our community the black community it wasn't in there neither was the information that when we went to the board of uh, of health and of the information that they had was nowhere to be found. Couldn't find it in City Hall, couldn't find it in none of the usual spots where things were supposed to be, the state representatives. We took it there. You know, to make a long story short behind that consistently going and building with other people that we had never dealt with before. And, uh, you know, um, we were able to, we wound up having the people from the Board of Health demonstrating with us at the, um, you know, at the governor's office that he's never at. And uh, um, we had the people from John Jay demonstrate because we found something in common. And uh, that was the hepatitis C. And what it did, we wound up building a bigger movement and got it to the point that, you know, Mumia wound up in court with it while the lawyers was doing their legal thing. I'm talking about the medical lawyers that was dealing with uh, Mumia, Bob Boyle and all, um, you know, fantastic lawyer and um, some other lawyers. But we wound up being in court. And, uh, you know, and wound it up in Stranton, which is a cold-blooded racist place. And people was warning us about going up there. But we going up there, we had the power truth with us. And we was taking it with us. And what we found out while being up there, the people up there was complaining about the same thing that we was complaining about. Their people that was in jail with these same um with, you know, with the same problems and, you know, talking about what was going on. So I'm saying we was constantly building more people so that when times that we called on them, we needed people, they were there. And that's how it was with everything, you know, that, you know, we did. And, uh, you know, you can't be afraid to step into any place or, you know, think that this place is below you or, you know, whatever. And uh, when you in this fight for um, our brothers and sisters last, brother Jamil Alameen, and uh um Pam, you've got two minutes left. Two minutes. I'm just saying the principle of unity um is going places you've never been and um gathering information if it's not in our black community to get it and to bring it there and uh and always stand firm and consistent against this government and um you know women. And, uh, you know, when I first came into the movement and, uh, you know, not only did I have, you know, because I didn't look like anybody, anybody else, I didn't talk like anybody else, but I, because of the love for the movement that I was taught, I learned to stand up. And, uh, you know, and be moved wherever I was at. And through the years, and our uh, brothers grew to respect me. Other people looked at me like this wild cursing, you know, little girl. And, uh, you know, um, it's that love. It's that love. And uh, giving people the chance to actually meet you. And, uh, you know, and most of the people met me on the front line. Um, 
but that consistency, you know, is what's really, really important. And all those isms and things, you just push them to the side, stay focused and keep on doing what you're doing. And you'll be able to, you know, I know this is how we were able to pull a lot of people, you know, around the world and all to help us, you know, do this work. And, you know, there's nothing that can be done for us without the people's power. I understand that, and that's all the people pulled together. Thanks so much, Pam. We want to have discussion. We want to have your comments and your questions. Please raise your hand or type stack in chat. Teresa, Elamine, and I will recognize you and get your question. You'll have two minutes to make your comment or ask your question. We'll take five comments or questions and then turn it over to brother Hakima and sister Pam for their responses. Teresa, is there anyone who is ready to go? Well, I just typed uh, the message in, in the chat, but I thought we said we would allow people up to three minutes uh, since this is such a big topic. Uh, about unity and I see so many uh, people uh, who can contribute uh, that we want to do three minutes. So, uh, and we want to ask allies of European descent uh, to stand back uh, because we really are using uh, black self-determination to drive this conversation about unity in the national uh, Black Liberation Movement, and we thank the allies and accomplices and comrades uh, for showing up for this session. Uh, but I thought uh, Betty Davis appeared, uh, she was given the thumbs up, uh, but if she would like to say something, because I think she has another meeting in a few minutes. So after Betty, I had kind of put pressure on uh, Khalid Rahim, who's a part of an important organization, if he would be willing to speak next. So Betty, sister, it's great to see you. Uh, would you share your thoughts about uh, this movement we're trying to build to unite around Three freeing minutes. our political prisoners? Three minutes. Uh, thank you so uh, much. Betty. I have a, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. ma'am. We have a, I have a clock, good to see you. George Friday, long time no see. Um, good to see you strong. Sister Pam, whenever I came to your protests in Philadelphia, I noticed you always had young people participating and um, conducting roles of leadership. Do you think you would like to talk about that? That's number one. And number two, I would advise everyone to go to the WBAI archives. I am not a fan of Gary No. I consider him a fascist, but he did a program on January the 25th, which connected the overall pattern of genocide between Fauci and Bill Gates. And all of you know that what happened in Washington DC on November 6th, was just an excuse to go after the rest of us. That's right. Okay, and we, if nothing else, that tells us we must have unity. But one of the things that is the, is the passing of the mantle onto the next generation. And I've seen some of the uh, leadership that Pam Africa and her organizations have done in that regard. And I wondered if she wouldn't mind commenting on that. I think that's my three minutes and thank you. Thanks, Betty. Mm -hmm. And the second person, Teresa. I'm sorry, Khalid Rahim, yeah. if he's willing. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. I want to say uh, greetings to everyone who's part of this uh, meeting. Uh, always good to hear the voice of Sister Betty. I'm used to hearing her voice because we belong to another formation and we, we hear her wisdom on a regular basis. Um, 
I represent two different formations within the Black Liberation Movement in general. One is an independent political party called the New African Independence Party. And uh, having been the uh, founder and now currently serving as the chairperson or chairman for this particular group. The second formation is the New African Workers Union, which is a relatively new formation. We've only been together for a little over two years. And they both reinforce one another. We looked at the prevailing relationships between uh, the two mainstream political parties, the Republicans, as well as the Democrats, their, their relationship to the labor movement, their relationship to organized labor, and how both parties either have ignored the black working class or have pimped the black working class. Uh, when it comes to the Republican party, uh, they basically ignored the black working class. When it comes to the Democratic party, they basically exploited and pimped the black working class. So we thought it was important um, that after we had started an independent black political party or formation that we take the next progressive step and to start and organize our own union as well. And so those are just two examples of what we mean by self-determination in a real organizational way. And I can say, having looked at the different individuals and different groups that are listed here as part of this gathering, many of the people on this call have done the same thing whether it's been around cultural organizations, economic development organizations, youth organizations, advocacy organizations, social justice, all of it. It seems like most of the people here have ventured out from the mainstream and expressed self-determination organizationally, right? By developing independent type of formations that can really speak the real issues, speak truth to power and really represent the interests of our people. I had two questions that I like to put out. And I know that the first gathering, I think there was some discussion around patriarchy. What I like to put out here is what is a functional definition of patriarchy as it relates to our movement? And when I say a functional definition, I'm not talking about a philosophical definition. I mean, what would patriarchy look like as we built among and between ourselves? Right, understanding that some of us, we come from different cultural traditions, religious traditions that define the roles of men and women differently. What does patriarchy look like as we move forward? And I think that's a very important question to address. Brother Rahim, you're at time. Oh, sorry. I typed something to you in the chat, but I guess you couldn't see that. Oh no, I'm sorry if, if I missed it. I was so engrossed, I'm sorry, I missed I, it. I know that can happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, can, I, can I mention the second part quickly? It's the same type of functional definition. I wanted to talk about self-determination politically. What would that look like within our movement? Okay, we got those questions. And now the United Black Wall Street had their hand up. Yes, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Sister Patricia Devine Muhammad, and we with one of our organizations is Money Boy TV, the Actual Facts Network. And we'd like to interview you all around uh, the issue of a comparison of the Black Power Movement and many, and especially like the Republic of New Africa and the issues surrounding that and in, in comparison with the insurrection that happened uh, three weeks ago in the United States. Whereas we know what happened uh, with many of our freedom fighters and our political prisoners. Whereas three weeks ago, many of those persons who actually <coughs> in the capital uh, were actually let go and just went right back to their normal life. Even when they were arrested, they were uh, let go on their own cognizance or on a very minor type of bond. So uh, we, I know we don't have time to discuss that there now, but if we can start thinking about that comparison of what our Black Power Movement and our political prisoners who were in prison, as opposed to the insurrectionists that occurred a few weeks ago. Thank you. Thank you. 
Do we have anyone else on stack? I don't see any other hands. Uh, Albert Hill Jones is next. I did speak with him prior to the meeting and he agreed to say a few words. Our Afro-Cuban comrade uh, building unity between Africans in the United States and Africans in Cuba. Uh, so brother Alberto Jones, uh, would you please speak with us uh, for three minutes? Thank you. I think we may have lost Alberto. Uh, I don't see him listed here right now. And he did send me, send me an email that he wasn't. I did see him. He was here I earlier. I saw a I note saying he was leaving. Saw a note saying he was leaving, Bilal? Yeah, I saw a note. He said he had to be excused and he was excusing oh, him. I'm sorry. No worries. Um, uh, well, George. Yes, I see that from Julia. Thanks, Julia. Well, we can get responses from um, Sister Pam and Brother Hakima from our first three folks. Uh, Betty's comments and question, especially your question for Pam about involving youth in leadership. And Brother Rahim, he posed two specific questions, one about the definition of patriarchy and what it would look like and about um, self-determination. And then the invitation from United Black Wall Street for interviews. Uh, Pam? Right, um, you know, involving, you know, youth in the movement, um, leadership, you know, we're taught that every child is a leader. Everyone in MOVE is a leader. And, you know, the children are giving, you know, they have so much to offer. And dealing with the children that's not MOVE is the exact same thing. So, you know, we respect and all, you know, the offerings from the youth and we do whatever it is we can, you know, to help them, you know, bring their ideas forth. And, um, you know, the importance of youth, you know, as I've seen in many, many organizations, and uh, um, this is our future. And, uh, you know, in our organization, we do not have separate meetings from the youth. And, uh, you know, we have problems within the family. The youth is a part of that because this is how they learn. They cannot learn from being pushed to the side. And all uh, you know, um, and having their opinions, you know, coming up, you know, for me coming up, you know, you did not speak and get involved in what was known as grown folk stuff, and uh, and the grown folks always knew, and that's the way I came in to move, but that was changed very, you know, very quickly, and I see, you know, there's a lot of other organizations, you know, that is that way, and all, uh, but it's mandatory that you know um, we respect youth and youth leadership and you know and 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 we gravitate to them you know and mumia mumia is like the pied piper of youth as well um so um you know our movement right now is you know um basically a lot of youth and all uh, you know there's you know like i'm there and all uh, but the youth itself is carrying the load on a lot of this and all, you know, and we're not afraid and all to allow the youth to lead and all, because if they make mistakes, we all work it out and all, you know, and see how those mistakes was made and how we can make it, you know, better. Um, you know, that's how we have a lot of youth and all, because our interests is, is all the same. And, you know, they're in a whole nother, um, world from us and all uh, you know they're dealing with things that you know we never had to deal with um you know and and they bring this you know um you know to us when we did millions for Momia and uh when we was building the platform the platform was built and our know, people was building the platform where we would have a youth or maybe two speak and 
you know, I had, did not like the idea of that. We bringing a million people here. We got a whole city hall around here. So the youth, we did have two youth speak on our platform. And then we spoke, two, two of us spoke on their platform. But the youth on one side of city hall, it was crowded and they talked about, you know, the things that was affecting them and they came up with you solutions. I don't understand. Let me make sure I'm muted. Uh, where is my thing? I'm not muted. Let me mute myself. Um, Pam, I know that Tanya not being muted interrupted you, but <clears throat> I neglected to let you know you had three minutes and you've gone to five. Ooh, you, you've well, given you us a stop. lot of great info on getting youth involved and why they should be involved. My apologies. So, Brother Hekima, Hakima, sorry, yes. you uh, have three minutes to respond to those sets of comments and questions, please. Okay, um, on youth, uh, you know, we were blessed with um, with the saying that uh, Sister, and Jerry, Sister and Jerry would always make sure that we understood that there is um, uh, no success without successors. And uh, so we must, I think, uh, always in our formations, not only consider the youth, but structurally make it uh, attractive, exciting for them to participate. Uh, and of course, in the formations that I've been involved in, we didn't necessarily do a good job at that, but we recognize the importance. Um, the question on patriarchy, I don't have, uh, enough experience and, and so a functional definition, I would pass on that and ask that someone else deal with that uh, question or concern. Uh, but I, I'll just say that uh, in most of the formations that I've been involved in, there was a push to have balanced leadership, male and female and all of our pursuits. Uh, in terms of functional, uh, or, in terms of the definition, the functional definition of uh, I hold up? I'm trying to mute this person. But in terms of a functional definition for self-determination, I think what the book is concerned about. Uh, I would stress that the first word in that, that phrase be really uh, deeply embraced. Uh, I'm not sure if you can even hear me over that, that chat. I have to find them to mute them. It's yeah, yeah. But, uh, Earlier when I talked about uh, self-authentic freedom, <laughs> the word self means that uh, we have the responsibility to, uh, to embrace who we are as apart from everybody else in the world. That's not to say that we don't cooperate and we don't deal with other people, but that self aspect of, of that word self-determination really has to be embraced. Uh, and in, in, in this sense is that no one on the planet is responsible for that self-identified entity that you call self, except those persons. And I think a good part of our problem is that emotionally and psychologically, we're still dependent on the plantation. And even when we raise the fish and we talk about black power, we really don't accept full responsibility for what happens to us on this planet. And uh, so for me, uh, self-determination means some, well, I shouldn't say, but total responsibility for the, the ultimate outcome. That's not to say that other people are not responsible, but I'll say for, I, I just give an example. If I don't I'm think you thrown, have time to give an example. I'm so okay, sorry. Good. Well, Three minutes is for quick. the opportunity. 
and <clears throat> I gave a little more because we were interrupted. Okay. But on stack next is Teresa Elamine. Teresa? Well, I feel it's very important uh, that we respond uh, to Brother uh, Khalid Rahim on his question about patriarchy, uh, because we set up the talks, Brother Khalid, uh, based on the experience of, experiences over the past 22 years. I was involved with the founding of the Black Radical Congress. Uh, it was set up uh, in a way so that it was intended to address the question of male domination in the movement, which is the simple working definition of patriarchy in the movement. I know that there are brothers uh, in the movement, and we did have quite a few debates about this over the 10 years of the Black Radical Congress, uh, because the women uh, in the Black Ra Radical Congress uh, met in October of that year when the Congress was founded. The Congress was founded in June, and the women came together in October in a special meeting. And the discussion became, what would it take for us as Black women to be free? Uh, because we know that Black women and women in general uh, are part of a society uh, that minimizes uh, their contributions. So we have been fighting for pay equity as long as I had a job. So you say that uh, a Black woman earns 63 cents to a man's white dollar. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that reflect male domination in society as a whole. Uh, but inside of the National Black Liberation Movement, we have struggled with this question. And I say this as a young uh, girl, really, at 17, who joined SNCC. And it's really true uh, what Kwame Ture, then Stokely Carmichael, said about women's roles. That has been a kind of theme over these decades in the movement. And the women who met in Chicago in October of 1998, we were different women from all different backgrounds, but mostly clearly uh, uh, revolutionaries. And we agreed that ending capitalism, imperialism, patriarchy and white supremacy is what it would take for us to be free. And when we're free as black women, everyone else would be free too. Uh, but what happened inside of the Black Radical Congress is that brothers literally fought each other for hegemony and I watched it happen. I was a part of it. Uh, the same thing went on with the Black Left Unity Network. And we can certainly talk about these details of the last 22 years uh, as we continue the conversation. But I do want to stop now and allow Kendall Johnson who had written in the chat uh, to be the next speaker on this next round, because we'll be going with a discussion until around 6.30 or 6.35. And we want to get in as many people speaking for three minutes as possible. Uh, and then when everybody who has spoken who wants to speak, we can come back around for second rounds. But for right now, Kendall Johnson, did I see you say something in the chat? Would you please unmute yourself and speak? Yeah, I mean, everything that I wanted to say, I, I put in the chat, but, you know, I was reflecting today and realizing that the revolution that, you know, I want to see happen and that needs to be built is going to be happening My, like the the people that I know and that I'm trying to organize are going to be the key organizers in a lot of ways of the revolution that needs to be built. So my question is like, um, how do we mobilize the youth off of the internet, and what do you think the contemporary roadblocks are to a mass movement?
Thanks, Kendall. Do we have anyone else now? I see that um, Brother Rahim put stack in. I want to see if there's anyone who wants to speak uh, now before anyone who hasn't spoken yet wants to speak before we get folks twice. Anyone? Well, we should definitely encourage that because part of uh, Empress Chi, uh, great if she would speak. And I'll let the person in who's waiting. Uh, we're at 37 people, uh, 37 people in the meeting now. So Empress Chi, uh, uh, did you have something you would like to say now? Greetings all and, and thank you, my sister. This is another wonderful, wonderful dialogue. And just briefly to speak on the issue of patriarchy and how that is applicable to what needs to be happening today. Um, like others for these past 24, almost 25 years, I have had the opportunity to really observe very carefully uh, what is really going on in our communities and particularly as pertains to liberation struggle type movements. Being a black woman who is also uncompromising like my sister Pan Africa, I've had the opportunity to see things that I've never imagined in terms of how our women are really treated, how we are really disrespected within some of the movement stuff. And, and it's become very disheartening and I'm looking so forward to future dialogues so that we can really talk more in depth about this and, and more importantly, what it is we're going to do about it. Because it is certainly for sure, uh, unless this is addressed realistically, we will not move forward as a people, uh, as our ancestors would like. Uh, well, thank you, sister. And I'm gonna put uh, uh, Kwame Kalamara on the spot. Uh, so we can have uh, some men to weigh in on the question of patriarchy who haven't spoken yet. Uh, and so uh, Kwame Kalamara, please. Well, I wish you would not have put me on the spot, uh, <laughs> Teresa, primarily because you got me on for the next program. Uh, but uh, all I can say is what uh, Empress uh, Chenesu had indicated really is uh, truly reflective of the reality. I would also say that the definition of patriarchy is uh, male control. So maybe that expands the definition uh, to a more functional level. Um, what I and the New African Independence Movement, particularly with respect to the um, New African People's Organization and the Malcolm X groups, uh, group, uh, grassroots movement, uh, our position is uh, revolution ain't happening without women. And it means that what we as men have to do is surrender our ego and recognize that the, any kind of power that we create has to be balanced and shared. And as we expand it to the health and development of our movement, it also means that we have to include our uh, youth. And this movement has to be considered to be intergenerational. And what we have to do is um, what we envision as equality and equity with respect to our relationships, we have to practice it right now. I think if we study the various liberation movements, uh, we know that there have been women who've been guerrilla fighters and they have challenged the male leadership and the male leadership's response has always been, well, once we defeat the colonizer, then we'll address it. And then after the colonizer has uh, been defeated, then uh, they have no motivation to change the power dynamics with respect to the gender. All I'm saying is we have to live our vision of this equality and equity right now, because if we don't, it's not gonna happen. So I'm hoping that little short little snippet 
uh, meets your uh, your requirement of me, Teresa. <laughs> was that sufficient? Thank you. Uh, it was uh, a big powerful, uh, as you always have a tendency to do, and thank you for the clarity. I say male domination, you say male control, and I would say they are synonymous in descriptions for a functional way to look at it. And we can cite many examples of that inside of the movement for unity over the past 22 years in particular. And we can certainly go deeper into that as we move these talks forward through April. Uh, now there was someone else, I thought another sister, Zakia, uh, was, was trying to say something. Let me just say this, Teresa. The reason why I said male control, because sometimes men tend not to understand what male domination is. So actually I was just trying to expand it in a much more uh, 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 way that, that we can really understand that, that issue. So that, that, that was, so I, the first thing that came to my mind was male domination also. Well, I, I thought I saw Sister Zakia who wanted to speak. Uh, did I mistake that? I did not raise my hand, Sister, not purposefully. I'm sorry. Well, I know that. Uh, is there anyone else who wants to speak before Betty Davis speaks? Uh, and I know that Brother Khalid wanted to be on the second round too. So if we're doing a second round because people are shy, uh, then we'll go with uh, uh, Khalid Rahim and then Betty Davis. Is there anyone else who hasn't spoken who would like to speak now? Uh, uh, Bessie Shavers, you have your uh, you're unmuted. So do you want to speak? Bessie Shavers. No, I just arrived. I had another uh, meeting. I had planned to attend this also. I'm primarily listening. Okay, good. Well, if you could, well, mute. if you could mute yourself, because if I see you, you I unmuted, I think you want to speak. I apologize. Uh, and so uh, that's okay. Brother Khalid, if you would go for three minutes and then we'll have Betty Davis for three minutes. Uh, okay, sounds good. Thank you, I'll sir. So thank you. I'll try to be as, as quick and as efficient as I possibly can within the three minutes. So with the three questions that I think um, were raised, uh, two were raised by myself and then there was the third question raised by a uh, young person or a, a youth. Uh, functional definition of patriarchy within our movement self-determination politically, what should it look like and what would it look like within the context of the Black Liberation Movement in um, the question of the youth, their role, so forth and so on, leadership, participation. What I also like to say is we need to recognize that right now there's a major battle going on. It's not a battle involving Republicans versus Democrats per se. It's a, it's a, it's a battle of, of, of politics, of principle and of messaging within the black community or the new African community. And that is the battle between um, the black radical tradition versus black liberalism or neoliberalism. Mm -hmm. And it's a very uh, vicious battle that's going on. And so I think because we recognize that when we deal with issues of patriarchy and how we define patriarchy, do we define it uh, based on the black radical tradition or, or is it being defined based on the traditions of black liberalism and black neoliberalism, right? And there is a distinction between the two. Are we talking about representation or are we talking about representation, but most importantly, power? Uh, the same argument would apply to how we define self-determination within the black liberation movement. Many progressive forces within the black community have aligned themselves intentionally and purposefully with the Democratic Party. How does that fit into a call and a, a, a strategy uh, around pursuing real black liberation, right? Is that part of the black radical tradition? When we have forces who have a history of being radicals, revolutionaries, 
who now have aligned themselves with the Democratic Party factions within the Democratic Party leadership for whatever reason and purpose. What does, how, how does that contribute to developing a strong radical revolutionary consciousness within the black community that can reinforce the push in the pool for black liberation? And all of that also has to do with the role of uh, youth and youth development. Right now, the messaging that's being fed to numerous black youth all across this country who've, who've like came, came of age during the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor insurrections is that the way to go is really not through the black radical tradition, but through the black liberal practice and tradition. And I'm not excluding electoral politics because our political party, for example, is an electoral political party. So we don't frown on electoral politics or participation. But for us, the only relevant politics is radical and revolutionary politics. It's gonna further an agenda of black freedom and self-determination. Anything else we define is basically neo-colonialism, which equals, you know, more like entrapment. So those are the questions that I wanted to put forth to this particular group. And I hope I haven't went over my three minutes in doing so. You're just at time. Thanks, Brother Rakim. And we may have lost you earlier, but there are on the recording, you'll be able to get some definitions for uh, your first three answers for your first three questions. They were all addressed by Pam and um, Akima. So we've got Betty and then United Black Wall Street. Go ahead, Betty. I just wanted to piggyback on what Pam said about trusting. Uh, the youth by giving them opportunities to make mistakes. However, in this struggle that we're again against the racism and fascism, they're not going to give you but so many chances. So to the comrade, the young warrior that asked, how do you organize? And I believe they said, you know, online through the media, uh, the example of the so-called fascist that led the revolt November 6th is an important one. He's a cop. I don't care what you say, he's a cop. And what happened to the Panthers was they were infiltrated. So how do you deal with this contradiction? You have to know your community. When you start small, organizing small, I give my props to Pan Africa and MOVE and the Republic of New Africa because they weren't afraid to deal with vegetables first. They weren't afraid to deal with housing first. And you don't have to get on the internet to do that. You got to know who you can trust. And there's an above ground and there's a below ground. And without below ground, you will not have an above ground. And you can't do that on the, necessarily on the internet. And I hope you can read between the lines. It's about trusting comrades. And when people say revolution to me, I get a little nervous because everybody uses that word, even the right wing. Revolution is that revolution does. We know there was a revolution because when you look at the 10 bills for the first Civil Rights Act, they were the 10 demands of the Black Panther Party. And that is why I say, start with freeing your political prisoners. You can do that online. Start with organizations such as MOVE and Jericho and Brother Bilal's organization. Start there, cut your teeth with freeing a warrior and you will be able to do some grassroots organizing on other issues. Thank you. United Black Wall Street. Yes, thank you again. Um, again, we would like to offer our social media platform as a way in which you can organize on social media. Um, a lot of young people, but not so young people are on social media. That's a way of uh, organizing groups throughout the world. I do want to, again, see how many in this uh, group and others can actually be able to um, help us understand their role in the Black Power Movement, the 60s, the a liberation movement, uh, uh, especially with the Brother of the Republic of New Africa and others that were um, 
talking about liberation, when the uh, Trump administration began in 2017, in January, one of the first things that Jeff Sessions, who was then head of the Department of Justice, did is said that he wanted to hunt down Black identity extremists, BIE. Now we have a dom another domestic terrorist, uh, a discussion of a domestic terrorist bill. Um, many uh, are kind of uh, leery about that because they're saying, again, that may lead to um, a, another COINTEL pro, uh, program uh, or looking at uh, infiltration of Black movements again. But I do think that this is an opportunity now uh, to bring out what was the difference between our Black liberation, Black revolution movements, and how they were treated as unpatriotic against the American government, and, and bring that in a comparison of the insurrection that happened January 6th. Uh, uh, we would like to have the interviews and discussions around that again. Thank you. Thanks so much. I would have said your name, but I don't know what your, your, your name might be. Um, but glad that you're here. Are there any other folks who have comments or questions right now? I don't see hands. I want to um, recognize the Southern Anti-Racism Network's board members who are on the call. I'll say your name and you can unmute yourself or take your, put your screen on and say hello if you can. Um, and forgive me if I have stepped outside of bounds. So, Mary White. You wanna say hello and where you are, Mary? Okay, then. Um, Mary's in the Triangle of North Carolina. Julia Bishop. I know you unmuted. But I don't Hello. Know. Oh, go Hello. ahead, Mary. This is Mary. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm very happy to be able to attend this meeting. And uh, I'm here in Durham, North Carolina. And I'm very excited about um, being in the company of such illustrious individuals. And I hope that we can share, grow, and um, provide more leadership for our people in the future. That's my comment. Thanks, Mary. Julia, do you want to say hello? Hello everyone, my name is Julia Bishop. I'm from the Southport, North Carolina area. I'm looking forward to working with leaders in the community here in the future. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Julia. Deirdre Whittlesey. Hello everyone, I'm Deirdre Whittlesey. I'm in Columbus, Georgia, and I have enjoyed the first talk and I'm enjoying the second talk as well. Thank you. Thanks, Deirdre. Um, earlier, Alberto Jones, who's also on our board, was on the call, but he had to leave early. I wanted to introduce folks just so you get a sense of our board and the strong um, commitment that the Southern Anti-Racism Network has in this process. Um, Teresa, I'm gonna turn it over to you because I see no more questions or comments. Uh, well, thank you, George, uh, because people are in for a real treat. Um, we have a video clip, uh, which is a video clip of Kwame Ture speaking. Uh, in May of 1998, uh, uh, a few months before his transition, uh, all of the SNCC folks and all of the other folks from all over uh, the African diaspora came together to do 
a major tribute to him uh, and to raise money for him uh, because he died of cancer at the age of 57. Uh, and so we, um, we look up to Kwame Ture, especially on the question of unity. So the clip that you're gonna hear is his short uh, uh, message uh, to John Lewis, uh, who I was in the office, the SNCC office, the night that he told John Lewis to get out. It was a very harsh moment. And seeing Kwame Ture say what you're gonna see him say to John Lewis, you can just grasp how much that meant to John Lewis and you will see that. So hopefully you won't be crying, uh, but then we'll hear from Minister Farrakhan who was at the same event. And he uh, actually did a prayer and brought the whole kind of unity question together. And we thought it would be good to end on this note as we get ready for next month and the unity talks. So many people seem to be here to listen and learn. Well, this is a major listen and learn opportunity. Uh, so George, if you could cue up the video uh, so that we can all watch it. Our struggle spreads like wildfire overnight. Marion Barry mentioned that on February 4th, 1964, students sat down were arrested by the end of February, thousands were, by the end of that semester, hundreds of thousands would be. Our movement spreads like wildfire. If you would look at the independence of Ghana, March 6th, 1958, within two short years, 1960, two thirds of the African continent would be independent. Our movement moves like wildfire. If you would look at the rebellions in this country and mark the first one in the 60s to uh, Watts in 1965, by 1968, over 350 cities would burn in this country. Our movement moves like wildfire. Once we begin to organize, we shall organize like wildfire. This is our responsibility. We shall continue to work for unity. We want to thank you. We promise you that we'll be faithful always to the people's trouble. We will always impose upon you your responsibility by trying to live up to ours. Our people must be unified, John Lewis. Our people must be unified, Louis Farrakhan. Yes. Our people must be unified, Marion Barry. Yes. And we have the responsibility and you have the opportunity before you to help bring the people together and you refuse. This is the worst act that you can commit against the people's struggle. Thank you. Uh, Brother Akbar was just reminding me that Ghana was March 6, 1957. Thank you, not 1958. We're just speeding up. All right, this is what we want to say. We want to thank you. Our party will continue to work for unity. John Lewis, you marched with Dr. Martin Luther King. One of the things the King taught me, I don't know what he taught the rest of us, was the true spirit of nonviolence. The example we give is reflected all the time. The NAACP attacked King. The Nation of Islam attacked King. The Congress of Racial Equality attacked King. The Urban League attacked King. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee attacked King, but King never attacked any of us. I call on you, John. Yeah to move forward seriously this spirit of nonviolence into a concrete reality of living unity for our people. You have the opportunity. You have all that is needed before you. And I'm sure after tonight, you'll have the respect and the love of all those who'd want to work for it. On our part, we're going to do everything to unite these people because we know once they are united, no force on earth can stop them. Thank you. Ready for revolution.
Thank you, Kwame. Now, ladies and gentlemen. That's for you. It's healing time. <laughs> In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, my dear brother Kwame, to all who are gathered here tonight, brother Kwame gave us our marching orders. And I want to say to Brother Kwame before I say this prayer that very few people that come this way find immortality. Very few of us who come this way find what Jesus called eternal life. One day, I sat with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and he said, Brother, you're always talking about love. What is the definition? And I gave him Webster's trite, worn out definition. And he looked at me and said, No, brother. The essence of love are the principles upon which life and the universe is based. And those principles are freedom, justice, and equality. And those who truly love struggle for these principles. And since are you familiar these with principles are eternal, Motto, those who struggle for the eternal excellent. principles ultimately find eternal life. My brother Kwame Toure, in my judgment, has fought for these principles all the days that I have known him. So I believe as a lover, he has very few peers because he has never wavered from this struggle for these three great principles of life. And so I say to you, beloved brother and struggler for justice and freedom and equity, there is never going to be a death for you or for those who struggle like this. We will live in that which we have given our lives for. And when the history is written and they talk about the struggle of freedom, justice, and equality for black people and human beings on this earth, they will always mention Kwame Ture with honor and distinction because you have earned it and the lessons that you have taught all of us, we will retain. And the marching orders that you have given us on this most important occasion, the people must hold us to those orders that we must create a united front. And so as Congressman John Lewis and I embraced and Mayor Barry and I embraced, and Congressman Rush and I embraced, and Muta Baruka and I embraced. This must not be just for tonight. But if we pledge ourselves to work for the total liberation of our people, then our lives shall not have been lived in vain and no grave could ever contain us. That only can contain our flesh, but the spirit that has driven us toward these three great principles is eternal and we, like those eternal principles, are also eternal. Long live 
Kwame Ture. Brothers and sisters, would you please stand? And I'd like to ask if we would just hold each other's hands. O oh Allah, guide us among those whom you have guided aright. Preserve us among those whom you have preserved. Befriend us among those whom you have befriended. And bless us in whatsoever you grant us. Deliver us from the evil of what you have judged. For surely you judge and none can judge against you. And those whom you befriend are not disgraced. Blessed art thou, our Lord, and highly exalted are you above what is set up beside you. O oh Allah, we thank you for this evening and for all who have attended. We thank you for the words spoken by all who spoke and the songs sung by all who sung. But above all, we thank you for taking us back to the beginning of our struggle for the freedom of our people. Because in that beginning, we found camaraderie. We found strength in each other. And even though our paths have gone in different directions, Tonight, by calling us back through the presence of Kwame Ture to how SNCC began and how those who began SNCC began with SNCC, but you've called us back to remember so we can make a new beginning. Our hair a little gray, our step a little slower, but our minds stayed on the prize, we can bring victory. So we ask, O oh Allah, that you bless Kwame Ture and bless all those who have struggled with him and bless all of us who struggle for the liberation of our people and for all oppressed wherever they are on this earth. And we pray that as he leaves this auditorium, that you will go with him and strengthen him and comfort him and make him whole and heal him. For only you can heal. For we need Kwame into the days and months and years in the future. Imbue his son with his spirit. Imbue those whom he has taught with his spirit. His life having touched all of ours, our life has been enriched by his presence among us. So let us take what he has given us from the creator and let not his life and work be in vain. He lived for a united front. Let us pledge that we will make that front a concrete reality in his name and in the name of those who struggle to achieve it. Bless his mother, bless his sister, bless his family. Comfort all of us knowing that we know that our life shall not be forever. This physical life will pass away, but what we do in the struggle of our people will live long after we are gone. Long live Kwame Ture. Long live those who struggle for the liberation of our people. I bear witness that there is but one God I bear witness that Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, and all of the prophets, wherever they have come from whatever part of the earth, 
They are one. God is one. And as Kwame has asked tonight, there must be unity in our community. O oh Allah, let it be. Amen. I hope you can hear me. I um, want to remind you to save the chat before you leave. And the way that you save the chat is at the bottom of your screen over to, over to the right side are three little dots. And one of them will say save chat. And that's how you can save the chat. Hallelujah. All right. Uh, George, uh, we had set uh, the session up from five until seven. And I thought with people hearing from Kwame Toure, maybe that would generate a few uh, comments before we close. Uh, because that was in May, 1998, Brother Khalid. In June, 1998, the Black Radical Congress met in Chicago and 2,000 people showed up. Many of us from SNCC showed up. However, in these 22 years since the death of our, uh, our comrade Kwame Ture, we haven't done very much on the question of unity. So please understand, good people, uh, that these talks are convened in the memory of Kwame Ture. When I was 17 years old, I met Kwame Ture in my classroom at Tuskegee. And he said, I'm with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and I I'm for Black Power, will you join me? And I raised my hand that day and I don't regret a moment. So that was my aha moment, good people. So I know what Kwame Ture stood for all of these years, though he was not able to do it himself. And which is why he confessed that all of the organizations attacked King, but King never attacked any of our organizations. And he was saying that for the benefit of John Lewis, because John Lewis loved Dr. Martin Luther King. He was a part of SCLC. At the same time, he was a part of SNCC, which caused a rift between John Lewis and Stokely Carmichael. That is the animus that you've heard about all these years between Stokely Carmichael and John Lewis. Now they both have transitioned. And so here we are. So the question becomes for us who are still above ground, are we going to waste any more time in developing the kind of unity we need to develop in this emergency situation, comrades. It is an emergency that our comrades are dying 
in prison. We got Mumia, we got Imam Jamil el -Amin, we got Russell Maroon Schultz, we got a big list of people who have been in prison for 40 years or more, and they are gonna be killed by the state through incarceration if we don't do something right now. So that's why we convene these talks. And we're so happy uh, that Brother Bilal Sunni Ali, who is the Amir of the uh, uh, Imam Jamil Al Amin Action Network. And I want him to say uh, a few words as we close uh, because next month, February 27, 5 p.m. at Zoom, we'll have Kwame Kalamara and we'll have Betty Davis. For the March uh, uh, session, we are going to devote it to Njeri Algani, who was a serious warrior freedom fighter. And because it's March, Women's History Month, we're going to have several women speaking uh, during the March session. And then the final session is not planned yet, but I believe Pam Africa, the final session is actually actually on Mumia Abu Jamal's birthday, April 24th, if I remember correctly. So Pam, if we can get our comrade Mumia Abu Jamal to give us a piped in message, that would be wonderful. Uh, but for now, let's hear from Brother Bilal Sunni Ali to close us out in any way he sees fit. And then we'll come back together on February 27. So watch for the notices sent out to your various groups and on Facebook and share the notice so we can have more people in the conversation on February 27. Our brother Bilal Sunni Ali, it's up to you. Thank you. Thank you again, uh, Teresa, and thank everybody who has stayed in for the, for the entire time. And thank those, even those who, those of you who weren't able to stay in for the entire time, you know, we thank everyone for participating. Um, one of the things we want to realize is that every, everybody doesn't get in on every call and everybody doesn't get in on every conversation. Neither is any one 90 minute session of us gonna solve all of our problems. What we hope we will do in 90 minutes or in, uh, in two hours of, of coming together, that we hope we will say enough to each other, enough with enough significance to make us all want to talk more about solving the, the issue of unity. I think we started off with Brother Hakeem's example of the example that, uh, that he has developed and others have developed um, the functional unity process and developing and, and developing a process and in institutionalizing that process in a way that it can bring about unity without anybody leaving the organization or without, uh, without anybody um, without anybody leaving their organization, is the is develop a functional unity process, which we can all use. I've seen it, I've seen it work in a number of instances where people, where people are friends today, who would have been enemies, you know, who were enemies, who were calling for the blood of each other. Uh, people, uh, young people, older people, I've seen, situations where they were they were in it where they weren't even satisfied with the results but but pledged to stick to the results and the and the uh and the wisdom that was put forth through the uh elders that came through that process and i would you know encourage people if you're not familiar with the african community centers for self-determination uh, to get in touch with Hekima and get familiar with us because it's a it's a process that's working. And you know, and I don't know 
of uh, other processes that are that are working. So we we want to um, we want to point to this to this process because we many of us have seen it work and many of us adapt to it. Um, I want to thank uh, Sister Pam Africa for sharing with us um, for sharing with with us uh, some of the some of the issues in which she has uh, she just I I was wanted to have a discussion with her to see if we want if we wanted to bring out some of the things that uh, that have helped us because because we we can we have achieved we have achieved unity we have achieved um, times where people are angry with us totally angry with one another and in, in the moment of anger uh, say things to one another that could last forever, but in 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 a, in a process in which people come together and talk and talk it out and realize the factors that are that are involved in their miscommunication, it helps us to it helps us to continue our communication, and that's the main thing that we want to achieve in, in, in achieving unity is that we we never nobody ever gets mad and say I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna pay my taxes I mean some of some of us may do that uh, but but do but things that that the that the state that the enemy state calls on us to do, we continue to do no matter how angry we get with with the with the enemy state, and we must adopt that, you know, have that love for each other, and that patience with each other. It takes a lot of patience to, it takes a lot of patience to go through sessions, uh, negotiate them, and, and bring about a sense of unity, and bring about a sense of unity that leads to a practice of unity that's long lasting. And that's what we're hoping to achieve. So we thank everyone for attending, but realize we're not, but these four sessions are may, may not solve the problem, but will work towards opening us all up to moving toward that point where we're solving the problem and we're building institutions and infrastructure within our movement that solves the problem. And I so want to thank Brother Hakima for coming on. I want to thank all of you who I see snapshots of you. Um, and uh, and uh, I don't want to start naming people because then then everybody will be mad at me for that because I didn't name them. So just want to thank everybody that's on here and even thank the people who left. And even thank those of you who went tried to get on um, who tried to get on and had some difficulty coming on. I understand that because I, I do that all the time. This is one of the first, this is one of the first things that I've registered for and actually got on uh, with, with, um, with George's help, uh, with Teresa's help, and with the help of some of you who know who you are on the call and know that I called you and said, if you got that Zoom connection, uh, give it to me because I'm supposed to be on and I can't even, I can't even find my way on. So uh, I want to thank everyone who helped me get on so that I could help facilitate this process and thank you and encourage all of you to continue with the process. Even if you don't, please continue with these calls, but even if you don't continue with this, with this avenue, you know, the bigger avenue is what we are on and, and we're, and we're moving to that. There's a lot, lot more that I could say, but we only have a few minutes left. So thank you, well, brother, one and all. Brother Bilal, brother Bilal, uh, could yeah. we do the Harambe shout, uh, which means I think pull together, and I think we do it seven times. So can you lead that with your powerful voice? Okay, I, um, thank you very much for uh, giving me a way out. I'm, a lot of people <laughs> may or may not know that Harambe, Harambe means uh, let's pull together. 
and Harambe is a Swahili word. And I want to say it in English. And I want us all to say it in English a few times because English is what we know. And English is what is what uh help what is what helps us understand what we're saying in Swahili. So I want to say it um and the and the, and the process has become in our struggle that when we do the seven harambes as a close to an event, we say it seven times and we hold a clenched fist salute and we thrust that salute into the air and we pull down, we say harambe and we, we pull down as we say harambe. harambe. And on the seventh harambe, we hold that as long as we possibly can to see how long we can stay together. So I don't know if there's some if there's some words that anyone wants to share after that, we can just shut it off. But I want to say, if we can all say seven times together, let's pull together. Let's unmute pull yourselves, together. give them a chance to unmute themselves because everybody yeah. is together. So everybody yourself. unmute yourselves yeah. first. So unmute yourselves. Unmute yourselves, everybody. Unmute yourself so we can all hear our voices together. Unmute yourselves, everybody. Unmute yourselves. Some people may have. Before we get started, Brother Blau. Let's. George, can you help them? Unmute yourself. All right. We want to we want to go ahead because we, uh, okay. Go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So we just want to say before we say Swahili, we just want to say let's pull together. 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 Let's let's pull together. Let's let's pull together. 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 I'll start again. One, two. So when the second time, my two fingers is up. That's the seventh Harambe, which we'll hold for as long as we possibly can. Harambe! 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 All right. Yeah. Yes. All right. Oh, all right. Yeah. All right. Peace, Peace. everyone. Peace. Everybody save the chat. Because we're getting ready to sign off. Uh, we'll see you February 27th if you can make it. Much love, everyone. Oh, peace. Peace. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Peace. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Peace and peace. blessings. Yes. Right. Save that chat. Save that chat. Call me if you need me. Oh, somebody can email me. I came in late, so I'm not gonna have much on the chat. So if somebody can email me their chat, that'd be appreciative. I will Ooh. look for it, Zena. Thank, Thank you. Me as well. I appreciated you all. Blessings abound. Sharon yeah. and Zena. I'll make a note to myself. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Mm -hmm. And looking right. forward to the next meeting and the meetings in between. All right. Okay, you all, and and I'm working on uh, doing some readings for Black History Month. So in the meantime, Prayers I'm at a Kia. Sorry, and Sharon, I, you're doing some readings, and in the meantime, yes, yes, um, books. We need we need uh, books to share with the young people, either um, by black authors or about black. There were three recommended on the chat tonight. So you'll see it on the list when I send it to you, Sharon. Thank you. I don't know if they're, you know, literacy level appropriate for your group, but they're, 
you'll check no, it out. No, no, no. I'm going to be doing podcasts as well about them. So it's just about us, you know, making sure that we're reading y'all. Okay. Very good. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Good night. Good, good night. night. I hope things get better with your person, Zakia. <laughs>